Hello, scholars. Mr. Long signing on. Today, we're going to briefly review just some of the key topics from the American Civil War with an emphasis on the consequences, both positive and negative, uh, that the Civil War had on our nation as a whole. First topic of review is the Anaconda Plan. Uh, the Anaconda Plan, this was the strategy used by the Union to blockade the South uh, and prevent them from trading with any foreign nations, whether it be Britain, France, Caribbean, wherever. Um, the Union was able to come up with and then execute this plan because the North uh, retained the majority of the United States fleet, whereas the Confederate States had very little in the way of uh, military warships. The South did rely on small, fast blockade runners that hopefully would have been able to sneak between the in the gaps in the Union blockade to then trade their uh, natural resources, in particular cotton, with foreign nations that were more industrial, like Britain and France, and hopefully bring back ammunition and weapons to keep the fight going. Um, the North wanted to use this strategy to hopefully starve out the South, um, not just prevent them from trading for foodstuffs, because even though the South was largely agricultural, most of their crops were cash crops, so stuff like cotton and tobacco, which if you ever try eating it, you may have a bad day. So they wanted to prevent the South from getting uh, food for their armies and for their civilian population. They also wanted to block the South from the rest of the world. Uh, the plan was that this would help shorten the war and spare lives uh, by forcing the South to uh, give up without you know, excessive loss of life on a battlefield. Second one is the Battle of Antietam. This is the bloodiest single day in the United States uh, military history. About 22,000 casualties, and yes, that includes killed in action, wounded in action, uh, prisoners of war, missing in action, anytime like the military lost control of their personnel. Uh, about 3,500 people killed in a day. Uh, still the bloodiest day in the United States history, bloodier than D-Day or Pearl Harbor or anything uh, along those lines. The battle itself ended in a draw, but the Union was able to kind of claim victory. Um, the context for the battle was the Confederate Army under Robert E. Lee was trying to move north into Maryland to win a victory in, uh, in the north and help put pressure on Abraham Lincoln to give up the fight as well as to convince Britain and France to support the South, much like how uh, the Battle of Saratoga during the American Revolution encourage the French to join the Americans against the British. The Union Army was able to stop Lee, and even though the battle itself on paper is a stalemate, because Lee was unable to accomplish his short-term gains of winning that decisive victory in the North to bring out the end of the war, Abraham Lincoln and the Union uh, General Staff were able to claim victory. This victory is going to uh, motivate Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, something he'd been sitting on waiting for a victory. So the Emancipation Proclamation followed the victory at Antietam. The proclamation itself decreed that all slaves in states that were in open revolt against the Union uh, would henceforth be free. The war, if you recall initially, was not about slavery, at least from the North, like the South made it pretty blatant about slavery with their declaration of secession but the north was just like now like we just you know we don't care about slavery as much as you guys do uh we just want the country to be whole again um abraham lincoln even campaigned on a policy of if i could keep slaves i would do it to preserve the country if i would free the slaves to preserve the country i would do that too so uh it's mostly just uh sorry i lost my train of thought uh where was it yeah so um, but turning the war into a war about slavery, this was defended by Abraham Lincoln because like I was trying to get to before I lost myself. Um, it initially wasn't a war aim. Uh, ending slavery was not an initial war aim, but Abraham Lincoln is going to make the war about slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation, at least from the Northern perspective. Um, he defended this as a war measure because if the slaves in the South uh, fled the plantation or went into revolt against the slave owners, that would require Southern soldiers to go home back to the farms and plantations to restore order, which would then weaken the number of uh, Confederate soldiers opposing the Northern armies. 
And so Lincoln defended this to the politicians in the North and to his people saying, hey, like, I'm just doing this to try to end the war and weaken the South um, and their control. Ultimately, it didn't really do anything, uh, <laughs> uh, not physically at least, because the proclamation had no authority in the South. That would be like Trudeau up in Canada issuing a law or an order in the United States, like we're just not gonna listen to it because you're not our government. And that's the way the South saw it. The Emancipation Proclamation, if you notice the wording, only in states that were in open rebellion. So border states that were still loyal to the Union that had slaves, like Maryland, for example, they were allowed to keep their slaves. So to over summarize and simplify saying the Emancipation Proclamation freed all the slaves would be an error. Uh, just applied to the slaves in open revolt, in, slaves in states in open revolt against the United States. Let's see here, had no legal power. I mentioned that. Uh, sh the Emancipation Proclamation shifted the war focus away from preserving the Union and made it more about slavery. So now this is a moral war. This is a moral crusade rather than just a political war to reunite the nation. The Emancipation Proclamation also had an effect that it pushed Britain and France away from supporting the South, where up until Antietam, Britain and France were flirting with the idea of supporting the Confederacy just to divide the Union and make the United States weaker as a whole. Um, but when the Emancipation Proclamation made the war in some part about slavery, both Britain and France had to take a step back and be like, nah, like, we're not going to get involved now. And the reason Britain and France drew the line at this slavery issue in regards to supporting the South is that Britain and France in the decades before the American Civil War had outlawed slavery uh, within their own empires. And so for Britain or France to outlaw slavery and then support a nation built and in declaring its independence large, in large part due to slavery would be hypocritical and would cause some issues at home in Britain and France, um, especially also in the international stage. So Making it about slavery is going to push Britain and France away from, Confeder from supporting the Confederates, therefore making it uh, a bigger challenge for the South to win the war. Uh, yeah, there's, we're not going to talk about a whole bunch of the battles. That would be delightful, um, especially some of the tactics and how technology changed, but we can talk about that more in class, just to try to keep this video shorter for you guys. So what the war cost, this is the main point of this video as we wrap up unit four. Uh, and this is the so what, like, yeah, we had a civil war, but how does that change the nation and why do we need to spend so much time talking about this? Um, let's start off with the human loss of life. Uh, at least 620,000 Americans died from the war from combat or disease. The civilian losses uh, could push that number close to a million once you add uh, disease and starvation for the civilian population, um, could be close to a million. If we do some simple math for context, so that's, one of the, that's one of the tricky things about looking at fatalities and casualties and death rates uh, in history is that the way the American or the world population has changed, these numbers don't mean the same thing and we need to understand that mathematical context to truly understand the gravity of the situation. So in 1860, the US population was roughly 31 million people, and that 620,000 puts it at about 2% of the entire US population. If we were to apply that 2% casualty rate for all Americans from the American Civil War to the 2019 population of 328 million, what we're looking at is just over six and a half million dead Americans as a result of a civil war if it were to be fought on the same scale that it was there. So when we're talking about that, uh, just over half a million, if we adjust it for the modern American population, yes, we added more states and uh, world population as a whole has gone up, but that's the kind of uh, context we're talking about 2%. So scary numbers. The war was the most costly war in the United States up until that point. The American Civil War is going to have the federal government take on a ridiculous amount of debt for the time, and the uh, graph over here should help illustrate that. So over here, we're looking at the federal deficit or the federal debt uh, as a percentage of the gross domestic product, so how much 
the value of all goods and services produced by a country in a year. Um, the Civil War debt isn't going to be the biggest debt we ever face. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, World War II, right around 1940 to 1945, that's going to be the largest so far. The graph that I borrowed this from has it, the debt going um, a lot higher, projecting the future goes all the way to 2050, so we don't have to pay too much attention to that. But if we're looking at you know, just these peaks, you know, World War I is over here. That's just barely over the American Civil War, if higher at all. And then you have FDR's New Deal policy right here with this spike, and that's higher, and then World War II. And then we have had more expensive projects take place. But for the historical context, uh, for the people living during this time, they never have seen the American government uh, pay so much money for something. Let's see here. Uh, 1860 national debt was 64, or just about $65 million. By 1865, the US spent roughly $5 billion with a B. Um, so that's a incredible increase. And you can even see how quickly this line jumps from before the Civil War, come on you, from before the Civil War up until the end of the Civil War itself. For, let's see here. So the war itself, we're looking at about $3.3 billion um, in total. Then we're getting these sources from a different couple places to give you a variety. Loss of human capital is about $2.2 billion. Loss of property, about $1.5 billion. Total expenses is looking at about $7 billion. And I think this was an 1875 or 1876 uh, estimate. Now, what's interesting about this source, the way it breaks it down, is that they look at financially, like, you know, if you do the metaphorical fi finances for every single person in the North and South, what kind of money was spent, how much debt uh, was being spread across the nation as a whole. And this is what I found interesting is that Northerners, their per capita debt was about $139, $139. And for the average Southerner, they were uh, in debt about $420. Once you spread out the whole, you know, the Union's debt and the Confederate's debt across all their populations, that's what we're looking at. So the South, uh, even though they were outspent, if you go into some of the articles uh, that I was reading, they were talking about how the North just spent more than the South. Well, the North had more to spend because they had a stronger economy and more people to pull from. The, if we're talking about um, cap, uh, financial loss, I hate to do this because it, it feels gross, but we're, we also need to mention the uh, financial value of slaves huh. um, that's going to also impact the South. Because one of the arguments that the Southerners use to hold on to their institution of slavery is that they've invested millions and billions of dollars into the peculiar institution. And to just throw that away without being compensated would be uh, catastrophic for the Southern economy um, with them not getting any money back for their investments. For example, uh, we have about four and a half million slaves being emancipated by war's end for a total loss of $4 billion to the slave owners uh, across the entire country who lost slaves uh, with the 13th Amendment that, that freed the slaves. So also adding to that, and again, it feels weird to talk about <laughs> human beings as uh, with property value, but it would be unfortunate to skip that. Uh, for the context here. Uh, what else did the war cost? The war is also going to establish once and for all the dominance between the federal government and the state government. This was a continuation going all the way back to Tommy Jeffs and John Adams uh, with the Federalist and Anti-Federalist debates and elections about how much power the central government should have or not have. Um, some would say that the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse ended that debate, that henceforth the federal government would be the supreme law of the land and the state governments were all subservient to it. Um, when you guys take U.S. government, you'll learn about federalism and see that's not so black and white, but this is a cultural shift within the United States that, yes, like the southern states with their confederacy, uh, with all the states being equal, could not gather the resources that a unified single northern government could and that cost them the war to some extent uh, culturally the civil war is also going to impact the way americans view themselves uh, self-perception is pretty fun to study 
uh, before the American Civil War, if you were a Virginian traveling abroad and someone asked where you were, you're from, you'd say, oh, well, I'm from the fine state of Virginia. And, you know, they'd ask, oh, where is that? And they're like, oh, the United States, which are over there. So talking about the United States in the plural and with an emphasis on Virginia. After the Civil War, the cultural shift started to change where now you didn't refer to yourself as a Virginian first and a United States citizen second. Now you are a United States citizen from Virginia. The second effect is that the United States going goes from being a plural. Uh, for example, the United States are west of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, instead, it's singular. And the Civil War settled that, hey, like we are one nation. You can't just go off and do your own thing. Like we are all in this for better or for worse. So now you would say the United States is singular, is west of the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, starting to change the way Americans perceive themselves and the nation as a whole. Uh, probably the most obvious consequence of the Civil War is that it's going to lead to the immediate end of the institution of American chattel slavery uh, with the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The 13th Amendment is going to free the slaves. The 14th Amendment is going to guarantee them their rights and citizenship within the United States. And the 15th Amendment is going to allow them to vote. Those three are going to happen in a pretty quick order uh, at the end of the war. Uh, even though the 13th Amendment freed the slaves in 1865, the struggle for social and political and economic equality is not going to uh, end um, anytime soon. And I like this image. Uh, I think it does a really good job of kind of visualizing how long we're talking about here. So if we're looking at 1619, this is when the first African slaves were brought to Jamestown all the way to 1865. This time period is where if you were black in the United States or the Amer British colonies before the American Revolution, statistically speaking, you are the legal property of someone else who can pretty much do whatever they want to you. They can, you know, they can rape you without consequences, they can kill you without consequence, they can separate families, they can whip you nearly to death, they can brand you with a hot iron, uh, they can sell you for pennies. It's pretty atrocious what human beings are capable of doing to each other. So that's the time period of American slavery. As we move forward from 1865 to 1954, this is going to be the era of segregation, also known as Jim Crow, especially in uh, the Deep South, so like Alabama, Mississippi, that time period. And so for 246 years, we had slavery up here. 89 years, we're going to have legal segregation. And that's going to end with the Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education, uh, which is going to formally end segregated society in the South. However, there's still going to be a number of hurdles that have to uh, be hurdled uh, to get past the point of uh, this racial inequality between blacks and whites, especially in the Deep South. Um, this is a struggle that's still being fought today. You can look at uh, the Black Lives Matter movement for a an example, uh, because there are still consequences and legacy and a legacy from the uh, these institutions and this systematic racism within the United States of America. Let's see here. Um, so that's going to be an ongoing process here in United States history. Ironically, freeing the slaves is going to give the South more of uh, more political power than they had going into the American Civil War. Um, so, for example. Uh, think back to the three-fifths compromise from the U.S. Constitution. So before the Civil War, if there were four million slaves in the South, three-fifths of that is going to be 2.4 million uh, people, which will then be added to the population for use in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College. So 2.4 there. Um, after the 13th Amendment, Three -fifths comp the three-fifths clause no longer applies. You are now, <laughs> you are now worth five-fifths of a person. You're now one whole person in the eyes of the U.S. Constitution, which is going to change that population from 2.4 to 4 million people um, in the South uh, for their African-American population. I did some quick 
sloppy math down below, just an example. So if we look at the total white population of the Confederate States at roughly 5.5 million, before the Civil War, you have five and a half million whites, 2.4 million slaves. That's about 7.9 million people in the Confederate States being represented in Congress. After the Civil War, you have your 5.5 million whites, 4 million freedmen now, and go ahead and subtract uh, the uh, Confederate soldiers who were killed. And yeah, I'm skipping some things like refugees and people who just fled the country or civilian casualties. So I'm skipping a few things, just to make it simple. But if we keep it simple for the purpose of an example, now we have nine and a quarter million people being represented. So in Congress, you go from 7.9 million to 9.25 million, which is going to give you more seats in the House of Representatives, which gives you more uh, legal power. It also gives you more uh, power in the Electoral College. So it makes the South more competitive, whereas before the Civil War, they weren't really competitive in the Electoral College anymore. Case in point, if you think back to the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln won the uh, uh, presidency without a single Southern electoral vote. Um, yeah, so that's a fun little irony of that as the slaves became free, it gave us South more political power. All righty. So here are your check on learning questions. I need you guys to submit these to me on Canvas. One, how did the American Civil War change the nation culturally? We talked about a couple different perspectives there. Two, how did the American Civil War change the nation politically? It's going to be a big one. And three, how did the American Civil War change the nation e economically? Um, I didn't go into too much detail about the economics of the Civil War. We did talk about spending and debt. But if you think back to the textbook, um, some things that you can draw on are the just like Sherman's March to the Sea, destroying the uh, economic infrastructure of the South. You can think back to uh, greenbacks and unsupported currency. Um, you can talk about, what's the third one? Greenbacks, you can talk about Sherman's March to the Sea. Oh, and you can talk about uh, profiteers and how some individuals are gonna be profiting from the war and that's gonna create a new class of millionaires that we're gonna see uh, do some pretty interesting stuff when we get closer to the Gilded Age um, and the Industrial Age. So those are your three questions. Go ahead and poke around. Uh, if you can't find those answers in the video, refer to the internet or the textbook and let me know if you guys have any questions. Other than that, I am done with you guys for this video. If you have any questions, shoot me an email or let me know in class and we'll get you guys squared away. Thanks. See ya.